Hello, welcome back. So, if you remember, I've spoken about in the past these cheap attempts to justify exploitation in capitalist societies by appealing to time preference, to risk, and so on and so forth. And this is precisely what we're going to be responding to today. And we're going to be responding to the version of this argument put forth by the academic agent. Now, in the past, I already responded to a video by the academic agent on the classical political economy. And uh, he told me that uh, if I wanted to go uh, speak about economics in his channel, I could. And he still hasn't followed up uh, on that conversation that we were going to have. So um, I guess we're not uh, going to have that conversation. But there's still things about his takes on economic issues that I want to comment on. So even though I maybe I will, but uh, it doesn't seem like I'm going to be able to discuss this with him directly. Uh, I am going to be making responses to videos like this one where he tries to make arguments on economic issues that I completely disagree with. So the title of his video is Why Workers Are Not Exploited in the Free Market. And here already we have uh, certain things to comment about because what he's saying here is basically that uh, there is no exploitation in the free market. And now we're going to speak about what the free market is. But that's basically what he's saying is that in this video, he's going to show us that exploitation doesn't exist. Now, remember that exploitation in the Marxist uh, tradition, which is the most prominent description, the most prominent theory of exploitation is the Marxist one. Exploitation in capitalist societies essentially means the differential between the amount that workers in a in productive laborers in a given industry produce and the amount that they receive back in the form of wages. So this is what he's going to have to disprove that this actually exists. And we can also measure this, as I've said in the past. So the rate of surplus value, which is basically the surplus value created in that industry over the variable weight, the variable capital, the wages that those workers receive is essentially the same thing as the rate of exploitation. And this is something that we have uh, empirical data for that we have, in fact, uh, statistics to demonstrate not only that this actually exists, but that it behaves in a certain manner and that it relates to certain uh, socioeconomic factors that uh, I've spoken about in the past and that we're going to continue to speak about. And this theory actually, uh, as, I've, as I've said many times by now, um, depicts something in the real world, which the academic agent is going to have to disprove. He's going to show that this actually doesn't happen. Is he going to do it? No. He's basically what he's going to say in this video is once again what I've said that um, people like him um, like to do, which is not disprove the existence of surplus value of exploitation, but to justify it to rationalize it, which is what we are going to be actually responding to, not to a criticism of the theory of exploitation, not to an actual rebuttal of the existence of exploitation, but to an attempted um, justification, rationalization of exploitation. Second of all, it is important to notice here the reference to the term free markets. Now, what exactly is a free market? We don't, we don't really know because there hasn't ever been a very precise and concrete definition of what a free market is, apart from the classical definition of, well, it is a, an, an economic institution where agreements are made voluntarily and there's no government control and so on and so forth. But in reality, the question here goes deeper because the, in the definition of free market, there is this reference to the term voluntary. And as I've said in the past, so Voluntary is not a term for which you can give a set of necessary and, and sufficient conditions because there's always coercion in our decision making, in our agreement uh, making. There's always some level of coercion that agents are um, facing when they make a certain choice, when they agree on something. So so this is this is important to keep in mind because Choices are never truly voluntary. So they can be more or less voluntary. So you can look at it in a dialectical fashion using, you know, more Hegelian philosophy where uh, you can look at different periods of time. You can look at different uh, interactions and you can 
see which one is more voluntary or which one is less voluntary, in which decisions there's more coercion being enforced uh, against the people who are well engaging in that agreement. But you can never really say this is not voluntary or it is voluntary, the same way that you could say, for example, that this is a microphone and it's not a pizza. So you can actually, you can't make these binary distinctions when you're speaking about philosophical concepts such as freedom or voluntary or justice, precisely because these terms are far more, uh, far better understood through this dialectical sense of relative to what? It's voluntary relative to what? And already by employing these terms such as voluntary or free, we are Superptitiously, they are moving us towards the realm of ideology. They are moving us not towards the realm of scientific inquiry, but towards the realm of justifying things, justifying the statu quo by appealing to some ideal of voluntarism that actually doesn't exist in the real world because there's always some form of coercion being uh, suffered by the person or well, being suffered depends on, on how you want to look at it but there's always coercion involved in decision making so action, as a proper sci social scientist you cannot just go to a anal do an, a scientific analysis of a uh, economic phenomenon looking at it through the lens of voluntarism through the lens of freedom of what um, of, of, you know, these ideological categories so that you can then justify that particular phenomenon that you're looking at. You need to look at it through a more scientific lens where you try to describe what it actually is, how it actually works, and then maybe you can give your own uh, moral considerations. But already in employing these concepts of freedom, voluntary, and so on and so forth, are not really leading us towards a path of understanding exploitation, but towards a path of rationalizing it, as I've said many times in the past now. Some people think that workers are exploited by business owners. In this video, I'm going to explain why that is not the case. Trade is not a zero-sum game, but an agreement of mutual benefit in which both parties gain something. So right from the very get-go, we can see how my initial statements about this not really being a scientific inquiry into exploitation, but an attempt to justify it are actually sound, because the first thing that he's going to talk about is trade, and, and trade not being a zero-sum gain. Now, no one in the history of economic thinking, as I've already told him, especially Marx or Engels, had ever said that trade is a zero-sum gain. Now, this is not actually something that has been claimed. And furthermore, Marx never said that exploitation occurs in exchange. Exploitation does not occur in exchange, does not occur when the capitalist advances in the form of variable uh, capital, uh, the wages of productive workers. So to say that um, trade is not a zero-sum gain as a criticism, as a rebuttal, of the theory of exploitation is actually factually incorrect because exploitation doesn't occur there. It occurs in the production process where workers work beyond what is needed for the reproduction of their labor power. This can be a trade of two goods or a trade of money for goods. In the latter case, the party selling the good is buying the other party's money, a small detail often forgotten. Now, the situation with work is exactly the same. The worker buys the owner's money with his labor. She gets his time and efforts and he gets her money. So this is actually not true because normally when trade occurs between uh, commodities by people who are just going to consume that commodity for their own personal consumption, uh, this is an exchange where the commodity is exchanged and it is consumed and there is no surplus created in uh, the usage of that commodity. However, it is different actually when the capitalist trades money for uh, the labor power of productive laborers because in this exchange, although the exchange itself 
is of the same form, what actually is happening here is that the capitalist is exchanging so that when consuming this labor power, they can extract surplus value from it. So this is what makes that trade different, not in the trade itself, but on what happens with the consumption. Because in production, consumption is what Marx refers to productive consumption. So it is a consumption of raw materials and of labor power that creates new wealth, not just consumes the wealth without adding up to, to, to the already existing wealth. The worker buys the owner's money with his labor. She gets his time and efforts and he gets her money. Ah, but you might say, he's being exploited, surely, because she's going to sell the fruits of that effort and make profits. He was shortchanged. No, because this claim crucially overlooks the role of time and time preference. Most people, if given the choice between taking £10 today or £10 in one week, will take the money today. But let's change that choice a little bit. What if the choice is between £10 today or the chance of £100 in one month's time? You have to go without in the interim, but if you can delay your consumption for that long, you could get more. Let's say after weighing all the costs and the benefits, our worker would still prefer to take the guaranteed £10 today. This is what economists would call a high time preference. He prefers a short-term, smaller gain rather than delaying and holding out in the long run for a potentially higher gain. But what about our business owner? Well, this is essentially the choice she is making. She is foregoing the £10 today to take the chance of gaining £100 in one month's time. So already when he's presenting this discussion to us, he has acknowledged that exploitation actually does exist. He has acknowledged that the profit of the capitalist class can only have its material basis on the surplus created by workers. So he has actually acknowledged the existence of exploitation. But now he's going to say, uh, no, actually exploitation, uh, although it exists, let me try to justify it. And what he appeals to right now to justify it, what is it that he appeals to? He appeals to time preference. And this is an important topic to cover because this is actually something that they truly believe disproves. Uh, well, it actually does not disprove the theory of exploitation itself because as he just acknowledged, the exploitation does exist, but it is an attempt to disprove the um, claims by socialists that, uh, well, this relationship of power is antagonistic and that thus we should strive to a world where workers need not sell the lab their labor power to the capitalist class where they can collectively own the means of production. So this is actually what's being challenged here. It's not exploitation itself, but the, uh, in a sense, the belief that we can do away of with exploitation by um, making everyone the owner of the means of production. And why does this argument uh, not even uh, consistently debunk this idea? Well, because for multiple reasons. First of all, because actually this is what he's trying to do here is he's trying to convince the workers that their exploitation is justified. But in the end, the workers are themselves the ones that are going to make the judgment of whether or not um, they actually feel like this system works for them. So it's so this would be analogous to talking to a slave in a uh, or in a slave-based society and telling them, actually, you know what? Um, sure, you are a slave and, and there's, you know, this antagonistic relationship, but actually it's justified because God set it out to be this way. You were born this way and you are just a slave by nature and so on and so forth. And it is different uh, biological conditions, different, uh, well, divine, in some instances, conditions that have determined your position of inferiority and the only thing that you can do is actually um, just stick with it. So this is basically what we are seeing here. We're not seeing a um, an actual refutation of um, the existence of this surplus value, but 
the attempt to make workers perceive this situation as a completely justified one by appealing to time preferences. And we know by the rich history of the labor movement, of the struggle of laborers to improve their conditions of work, to improve their wages, to be treated in a manner that uh, well makes them feel more uh, self-sufficient and that uh, improves actually their, their livelihoods and their well-being, that um, this relationship is actually antagonistic. The relationships of production in capitalism lead to this antagonism because when workers strive for better wages, for better working conditions, profits, as we've already noted, uh, actually r decline. And this is actually empirically demonstrated. So what happens is that this antagonism now finds itself in the position where by improving the actual material uh, well-being of workers, you are decreasing profitability in that economy. And this leads to recessions, this leads to problems because capitalism works within the framework, within the, the logic of profitability. So this is actually antagonistic. Capitalists are trying to get as much profit and workers are trying to uh, not be exploited as much to have better working conditions to actually uh, well live and work in an environment that works best for them. And this is not necessarily the case that it is consistent with greater profitability. In fact, it is often not consistent with greater profitability. So this antagonism actually exists. And this is something that uh, the academic agent is overlooking. He's overlooking that this antagonism actually exists because his only purpose in this video is to justify this antagonism by forcing the workers to imagine a world where it is only preference, time preference, what determines the status of superiority of a determined individual, not even of a class, but of individuals, because that's what they like to do, abstract from society. And this is this is really an important uh, point to object to, because there's actually antagonism, there's actually material forces that drive people to behave in the certain ways that they do. And if workers find themselves in an environment that truly runs against their own interests and they see this so they are not their mind is not obscured by the, by ideology like the one he's trying to present to us here they are actually going to uh, try to rebel against this system so this is an important consequence of uh, the scientific theory of exploitation that we can actually understand make sense of these facts of these antagonisms and at the same time, as revolutionaries, we can support the workers in their struggle because we want, as do the workers, uh, a world where uh, they can have better working conditions, where they can actually live a self-fulfilling life and so on and so forth. So keeping this in mind, let us look now to how exactly it is believed by the academic agent that time preference disproves the theory of exploitation. Well, this has a very simple reason to it. Now, he claims that uh, different people have different time preferences, and this is actually true. So some people would like to consume closer to time. Some people uh, are willing to postpone consumption to a future, to a moment in the future. And uh, this is actually something that, uh, that occurs. But how do we move from this to exploitation is therefore justified where the claim is that uh, there are some people who are willing to um, not consume in the present moment and invest in a productive um, well in a production process so that they can receive in the future a given set of uh, commodities that they can then sell to receive a profit so the idea here is that the workers are the ones whose time preference is actually uh, far more close to the present time, so they prefer more current consumption to future consumption, and the capitalists are the ones who prefer future consumption to present consumption, and thus, because this is the case, the exploitation is basically justified, uh, because it still exists, 
but it's it's just that now uh, we have made sense we have rationalized this exploitation and this is actually wrong for uh, a set of reasons so first of all it is actually the case that people as i've noted before have different time preferences but i would actually like uh, to see empirical evidence that uh, it is time preference what determines uh, the level of income of people what determines actually uh, the class status of a determined person so this is something that actually would need empirical evidence to be supported and second of all even if there were evidence that people in the capitalist class uh, are willing to abstain from personal consumption more than people in the working class what we are abstracting here is we're abstracting from the material concept the material uh, circumstances that lead to preferences because preferences don't exist in a vacuum so people don't live isolated from each other people don't live in a vacuum where they somehow get the preferences into their heads and then they go into the world and act based on these uh well magically appearing time preferences so this is actually not how society works so when we're speaking about preferences if we want to understand them it is not just enough to appeal to them but to actually see that a fundamental aspect that determines these preferences is the environmental socioeconomic factors that uh, a person finds themselves at, in right so again they don't come uh, magically from the sky but they are actually the product of a given set of material circumstances and here is an important part because what they always uh, seem to ignore what people that justify that try to rationalize using this argument and the risk argument um, they always forget is precisely that preferences need to be backed by material circumstances in order to be materialized in some sort of uh, consequence in some sort of action so i could perfectly well uh, be willing to uh, invest a uh, hundred thousand dollars today in a given production process and abstain from using those hundred thousand dollars so that i could receive a greater profit in the future but if i work uh, 12 hours a day and i received a barely minimum wage and i cannot barely even make ends meet how am i even going to be able to materialize my time preference how am how, how am i going to be able to get to a position where i can actually um, see the fruits of my investment uh, in place so it is not just simply enough to prefer something for your preference to actually be materialized in reality but you must actually have the material possibility of taking action which is something that the vast majority of people cannot do this material possibility of investing of having a the possibility of of being in a position where you can actually live a more self-fulfilling life is, is something that a lot of people don't have they need to sell their labor power in exchange for wages because they cannot uh, become the capitalists they cannot magically start their own businesses and so on and so forth this is something that just it is ridiculous so in the attempt of justifying exploitation the best that we can really come up with is this well you know people have different time preferences and you know the capitalists have a great they they come they prefer more uh, future consumption to prefer consumption to persons of consumption so they are going to invest now and then in the future they will receive their profit but hey they have advanced to the workers who have a time preference that is they prefer a lot more present consumption so they have actually uh, made the workers better off by giving them wages today instead of having to wait for the future but you're abstracting from the fact that in order for that to take place you must have the material possibility to do so and normally the people that have the material the material possibility of doing so are the ones that are born are the ones that uh, have uh, a certain uh, uh, material wealth because you know this normally you don't see a lot of people becoming rich by 
everything that they that they have investing it not eating anything for decades and then receiving the fruits of some investment that they did it is not really how people become rich i mean if it were um uh, you know it would be a very uh, bizarre way of uh, running your society where the only way for people to actually become uh, wealthy or, or for people to actually be self-sufficient is to uh, make them starve for 10 years and then hopefully receive some profits but um, but the reality is that capitalists don't necessarily even have greater preference for future consumption than prefer the present consumption in fact wealthier people uh, tend to have a, a consumption that is uh, you know uh, far more consistent than the consumption of uh, well, uh, lower income earners precisely because they already have a lot of money so they can pretty much spend it in whatever they want and they have the material possibility of setting aside some of that money to invest it in a production process to get more profits so normally investment is done by the capitalist class as a whole is done with the profits that they have received from the prior from the prior year so that if the profit rate if, pro if profitability decreases and the mass of profit tends to uh, de increase at a slower rate or actually decrease you know what this is going to do is disincentivize capitalist uh, the capitalist class as a whole of investing more and thus what normally tends to um, uh, bring about investment today is profitability in the past and one and what brought about profitability in the past is a production process where there was surplus value created because that's that is once again the material basis for the profit for the profit of the capitalist class as a whole and then after the academic agent has attempted to justify exploitation by appealing to you know there's people make different choices uh, according to the preferences that they have and thus uh, because some people have preferences that lead to outcomes that are more profitable for them that this is all completely justified uh, abstracting from society abstracting from the material possibilities that each individual faces abstracting from antagonisms abstracting from class abstracting from the actual fact that what he's presenting doesn't deny the existence of surplus value what he's now going to do is he's going to try to employ another trick uh, which is giving different scenarios where a circuit of capital where the capitalist invests in uh, workers a certain amount of money he's going to say 40 pounds uh, where this circuit of capital doesn't lead to a profit what if the circuit of capital what if the process of production doesn't lead to a profit well this is something that marxists have contemplated uh, for a long time and this is actually something that marx himself understood very well that a lot of businesses fail and because he was looking at the real world not at some idealized world and he understood that it is not necessarily the case that if you invest you're going to receive a profit so marx understood this very well so this is not really a problem in the theory of exploitation at all because when the capitalist invests in a production process and he or she doesn't receive a profit well too bad for them sure they have advanced uh prior to to the end of the production process the wages of the workers in the form of variable capital so the workers and this is not this is not always the case that workers get paid even if the prof if, even if the company makes a loss or that they get paid before even the production begins or before the production ends um this is actually something that uh, it's not necessarily the case but it it is certainly the case uh generally so we can speak about it as a general case um but even if the company doesn't make a profit this doesn't mean that the profits of the capitalist class as a whole are not actually the product of the creation of surplus value and thus that they have their basis in exploitation so you can point to a circuit of up an individual circuit of capital where there's no profit being created where there's actually a loss and yet you're not justifying anything because it is still first of all you're not denying us we this is a pattern that uh, continues to to manifest itself um it is not you're not disproving the existence of surplus value once again 
and you are at the same time not justifying anything because it is still the case that the profits as a whole of the capitalist class emerge from surplus value and uh, normally the profits of the capitalist class as a whole are positive and the profit rate is normally uh, a profit rate is normally positive so uh, and even if the, ca the the profits of the capitalist class as a whole were negative this would actually mean a serious economic consequences so uh, this is actually something that I, I would guess that the academic agent himself wouldn't want so um, you presenting this as a refutation of the of exploitation um, it's really it's really childish it doesn't it doesn't really refute anything um, it doesn't even justify uh, the phenomenon that it's trying to justify and sure capitalist individual capitalist might make a loss but this has nothing to do with the fact that uh, aggregate patterns still emerge from uh, well, uh, economic institutions from economic relations and that these patterns lead to certain outcomes that um, well are antagonist that that are rooted in antagonism and that thus um, capitalist societies uh, are constantly in this process of instability of booms and busts and so on and so forth so a complex economic phenomena cannot be understood by looking at a single um, capitalist making a single investment and imagining that it doesn't make a profit and therefore because they had in the past uh, before they made the loss advanced uh, some money in the form of wages to those workers that exploitation uh, it actually doesn't exist well no you're actually not disproving anything and uh, the case for uh, the Marxist theory of exploitation is still there is still very strong and the case for the social ownership of the means of production the collective ownership of the means of production is still there it hasn't been refuted at all so this is pretty much it for now if you ever encounter people who um, present this uh, time preference argument or the risk argument capitalists they take so much risk so therefore they must be benefited uh, with profits uh, therefore uh, exploitation is justified whenever you're encountered with these arguments you can always ask these people first are you realizing that you haven't disproven the existence of surplus value and second are you accounting for social factors are you accounting for antagonism are you accounting for uh, class division are you accounting for the material circumstances that lead to people having different preferences that lead to people making certain choices that these choices don't just come from the exertion of some voluntary free will these are clearly things that uh, you can ask them and this is, these are actually things that they, they don't they, they just don't consider because in their attempt to justify the status quo uh, presenting this idealized world where people just make voluntary decisions and everyone is happy after exchange and they don't look into the production process because for them exchange is everything uh, and, and of course if you look at circulation through this lens of uh, looking at it from the abstract and and looking at it not uh, scientifically but with the already preconceived notion that this is going to lead to the best possible outcome uh, if you do so the obvious answer that you're going to get is well uh, in the free market there's no exploitation trade is always and everywhere um, a happy thing and um, we should try to establish uh, we should try to move towards that ideal of uh, free of, fr of the free market um, which is uh, logically the, the conclusion that they get from the flawed uh, thinking mental process that they have gone to get to that conclusion that in a lot of cases uh, was already there before they try to present this rationalization for it so with that being said uh, if you like this content you can always support it by liking subscribing and so on and so forth and i will see you in the next video